Um, and I just want to just give the Lord the glory for being able to be here, for experiencing the presence of God this morning. Um, later on in the test, we will just go, just give a little insight as to what it's like down Southern Ireland the last year. Um, I would say we are weary and tired, but the presence of the Lord this morning is worth six weeks of holiday. <laughs> it was like times of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. That's what we need more than anything else. And I just thank the Lord for that. Um, I, I can't really talk about my testimony uh, until I go back into my family's testimony because this gospel doesn't just... It's not converting to another religion. It's not turning over a new leaf. This gospel transformed our entire family beyond recognition. That's what the gospel does. And so just to go back a little bit, um, my mum and dad would have been uh, from Cork City. And my uncle, um, they were your average Catholic, not very church going. Um, but the, my mum's brother was very religious and he decided that he was going to become a priest. So he went to study in a Catholic seminary to become a priest. And this would have been back in the 70s. So you're, you must just think 99.9% .9 Catholic. You never meet anyone else who isn't still to this day. Anyone I speak to often have never spoken to anyone who's not Catholic. This is just the prevailing. That's all anybody knows. It's part of the culture. It's everything. So my uncle is training to be a priest, and as part of their training, they were required to read the Bible. And at that time, and even now still to this day, there is no um, kind of encouragement to read the Bible. There wouldn't have been any, any idea that the average person, but the priest was to read the Bible so that he could understand. And as he began reading the Word of God, he began to realize, hang on a second, this doesn't line up with what the Bible says. I'm giving up my life for something that's not even in here. And there is one verse, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, and it says, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That blows all, everything out of the water. All the saints, all the praying to Mary, the whole lot. It shatters it all. And so he left and a couple of others at the same time or in around that time. And all he knew was he just wasn't going to give up his life for something that wasn't in the Bible. This was a big consternation back in the early 70s. This was like, what, shock horror. Um, and so he met a man then who had heard the gospel by accident on a long wave radio on his boat. And he tuned into a gospel station in America because <laughs> he was long wave radio. Remember now, there was no Christian radios or nothing. This is just alien. And no internet now, remember, no Googling, just cast yourself back. So he heard the gospel and it, he actually just heard Jesus died for you. And he just switched it off like, what was that? But the Holy Spirit did a work in his heart. And he met my uncle led him to the scripture where you must be born again, Nicodemus, it's as clear as anything. And so my uncle became a Christian then and started prayer meetings in his house. So my father, whose hair was down to here, <laughs> um, fierce for the drink, and actually was starting to do drugs apparently as well. And at this stage, I'm two years of age. And so I obviously have no recollection, so I'm just depending on them telling me the story. And my father said he was going to go to the prayer meeting. Now, I know if you know me no more than five minutes, <laughs> we're not exactly a genteel family. My mother got so incensed uh, that she threw a sugar bowl at his head and said, if you go out that door, you're not coming back. Um, but thankfully, he did go out that door. Uh, I was in his arms. It missed me. <laughs> Some people might wonder maybe it did get me. <laughs> and my father left and went to the meeting that night and got saved. And even the word saved it was, oh, remember now, guys, completely alien. This is just the Bible. This is it. And so my mom is like, what? It's a cult. What on earth? But s six months later, my mom became a Christian. And so our whole lives changed. We, my father was living in the flats and a part of Cork. It's just, I don't know, the equivalent of Belfast here. I, I, it's just the expectation of your life is a certain way. You certainly don't go to college. You a couple of kids by a couple of different guys. That's just the way. This is the way it is. That's where you're brought up. 
But as soon as my, this is what I'm saying about the gospel, it turned our lives upside down. They didn't just start going to another church. Or they didn't just change religion. Whole life, they stopped drinking. I mean, I don't know what my childhood would have been like. My parents don't think they'd even be together. My dad thinks he may not have even lived beyond his 30s at the rate he was going. So it's just, our whole lives changed. So our parents were, you know, reading the Bible to us and, and they were very clear. And, and this is something I really, I'm blessed by. They were very clear that we needed to be born again. That you, Within Catholicism, if any of you are aware, you get christened. So I would have been christened and then that's it, sorted. But they were very clear that you cannot pass down you can't pass this down. It has to be an individual experience. So as a child, I'm listening to the Bible. And I was very young. And so for you kids here, you don't have to be a certain age. I just believed the word. And my mother was reading out of the passage where it says about he took the keys of death and hell. And I was, I was only about six years of age. And I remember being overwhelmed with this idea that Jesus would take the keys of death and hell. And I just burst out crying. And I was like, I want to know this, Jesus. And I just prayed. I remember the Paisley Duvet cover, purple. I can see it in my mind's eye. I remember kneeling there and asking the Lord to save me. And apparently, now again, I, I'm obviously not very aware of myself, but people around me would tell me that before that, I was quite a sullen, quiet child, quite timid. Obviously, that has changed. And the next day, literally, after I got saved, and this is an encouragement to kids in here. Like, you think, oh, no, I can't bring my testimony. I wasn't doing heroin and drugs, and I didn't experience this, that, and the other. But the gospel, you can see a change because it's supernatural. So apparently, I was being driven into school by a good friend of ours in the car, and all I was talking about was, look at the trees, and look at the... Many people say in their testimony how they suddenly nature woke up to them. And I'm going, oh, look at the trees. And look, and I literally, my whole personality changed. I know Garrett might pray that maybe some of it would <laughs> go back. But the Lord just gave me a joy, a joy in my heart even as a child. I had a boldness and a confidence in Christ from that day. And I never once doubted, never once doubted what God was doing in my life. And so I would have, you know, gone to church and listened to the songs. And so fast forward till I'm about 16 years of age. Look, there's a whole other story where my family weren't in church for a long time. I had a desire in my heart. I had heard people talking about baptism, the Holy Spirit. And I was like, I don't even know what that really means. But if, if anybody in here comes in here and you look at other people and you see them really worshiping God. Do you ever see somebody praying and you know there is a level of prayer that you can't seem to kind of get to? There's a freedom in worship. And as a teenager, I was kind of paralyzed in my self-conscious teenage stance. And what I longed for was to be able to worship the Lord in freedom. I wanted that. I could see it in somebody's prayer. And that was the reason why I asked at a meeting. I hadn't been in church for about three years. I was invited to a prayer meeting. In fact, Garrett was there and he didn't know my future husband was sitting across the room. And I sat on the seat and I just remember just a desire coming up out of nowhere. And I just prayed under, to myself, please, Lord, set me free. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And you know that scripture where it says, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living now I, I know there's various doctrinal stances and all about baptism and the holy spirit but i'm telling you guys i've experienced that in reality that bubbling i couldn't stop it didn't even know what was happening to me the joy of the lord it just bubbled and bubbled and, bubbled, and i couldn't contain it it was like it just spilled over i was on my feet i was praising the lord i said Garrett was like what I was, do you know what happened as well? The word of God lit up to me. I suddenly knew what it meant. And there was a whole different level. Now, I was as born again the minute before, don't get me wrong. But it was that fire, that freedom, that supernatural element. And I encourage any of you here, whatever, you know, even you've been brought up with or whatever you think. But honestly, guys, this is a gift. Why would you say no? And it is a gift because I didn't earn that. I was not on top of the mountains. I hadn't fasted and prayed. I, I was literally a teenager sitting in the meeting with a desire in me 
to worship God. And he set me free. And what that led to, and I believe the main purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to witness for Jesus. Not for me to go around, oh, I've got the baptism of the Holy Spirit badge and I can do this, that and the other. It's actually to power to witness. So I would have been in a Catholic secondary school. You don't really get a choice. It's 98% of schools are. I was the second non-Catholic in the history of the school. The first girl that had been there had actually gotten saved as a 17-year-old and was thrown out of home. And she had since just passed through the school and I was the next one in. So I was allowed to just do my homework at the end of religion class. So for the, before I was baptised in the Holy Spirit, I hope I'm not offending you, I told them all I was, ba- I was Methodist. I just thought that sounded a little bit more <laughs> respectable. Uh, because Methodists, they understand, but if you say born-again Christian or Bible-believing Christian, to this day you'll get people go, oh, what is that? It's still, like in their heads, it would be a cult. So I, was, I kept my head down, didn't say much, didn't do anything wrong. I was a good girl, but I kept my head down. I didn't say a word. But once I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I couldn't care less. I was like, God. Oh. So anyway, I'm sitting in religion class, and I'm doing my homework. And next thing, Sister Mary. <laughs> Sister Mary says, now, girls, we know that Mary was born without sin. And I'm going, what? No way. So I was like, and she was like, oh, Jackie. She was delighted that I was participating. I said, uh, sister, um, where in the Bible does it say that Mary was born without sin? And she just went bright red. And she, went, she just got really mad. And then the girls turned to me and go, what? It's not in the Bible. Seriously, what else isn't in the Bible, sister Mary? And the whole class just went, Phew. And so she just fumbled, they got louder. Then she just got so flustered, she finished the class. And I I just left, I can see myself going out of the classroom and they all just converged on me, the whole lot of them going, what else isn't in the Bible? What do you mean? Like, what, what, what? So I just, just preached gospel. And I mean, I wasn't planning on this. And as I'm speaking to them, they start crying. One girl starts shaking, and I'm going, I don't know what to do with this. I'm only a young girl. I'm, like, surrounded by, I'm I'm on my own. And so I just kept going. One girl got so, so convicted, she picked up the Bible, and she flung it across the room. I was bombarded with questions, and then I decided to get baptized in the Bandon River, and I handed out 70 invitations um, into the class. So next thing then... We got at an assembly called. Now, assembly is usually only called if somebody robs something or <laughs> something serious is going down. So we're going to the hall going, lads, what's this about now? So we all go in, and then it, the, the priest, the bishop, the nuns, they're all up on stage in the assembly hall, and they say, Jackie, could you please leave the hall? And I'm going, lads, what on earth? Basically then, I was taken into a room with the bishop, and just cross-questioned and told this is a Catholic school and the girls are being told you're not allowed to go to our baptism. Uh, Those invitations have to be handed back. What had happened was the parents had rung into the school saying, what is happening in the school? Our children are crying. They're talking about the Bible. What is going on? And so my parents were called in and they were told I'd be expelled if I said another word this is a Catholic school, I must keep my mouth shut. And I was to take back all the invitations. Was that easy on a 17 year old? No. But I, I, you know, they were really going at me, you know, saying, oh, well, you know, there's, there's visions and there's Medjugorje and there's this, that and the other. And that's where we get some of our revelation from. I'm like, I'm sitting there, I'm only a young one. But you know that scripture, it says, don't worry about the Lord will give you the words. I just turned around and I said, the spirit of God only witnesses to the word of God. If it's not in there, that's not the spirit of God. I don't know what spirit that is, but that's not the spirit of God. And again, their confusion And I knew the Lord was after giving me everything they said from that on. That's not the Spirit of God, because that's not in the Word of God. Um, After that then, uh, they assigned a teacher to stay with me, to supervise me on my lunch break, so that I wouldn't be able to speak to any of the other girls. Um, And at the baptism, 
a couple of them did come with these big parka hoodies. Do you know? Remember those ones with the fur? And a couple of nuns came to watch to make sure that none of the girls turned up. So at least some of the nuns got to see. I did find out a few years later that some of those girls did get saved. Um, and I remember getting my hair cut in the local hairdresser in the town and I had my convent uniform on and she's cutting my hair. She said, did you hear about that? What's happening in the convent? There's a girl up there and she's talking about the Bible. I'm like, hey. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not getting a bad haircut. <laughs> I'm so strong for the Lord. I, I suppose, look, I honestly didn't ask for that, plan for that. It was good for me. I, I knew I was different. I knew that I was never going to be able to fit in. And I just thought, well, if I'm not going to fit in. And that I, I did my leave insert. All that time then, I spied a lovely looking young fella in the church. <laughs> he was not as young, but. <laughs> and so I, he was very, very quiet. He never opened his mouth. And then one day he spoke and I went, ooh, he's kind of nice. <laughs> so then that was Garrett, obviously. <laughs> be bad if it wasn't <laughs> and I was just besotted I still am and oh <laughs> and so that was it he was dead I basically talked him into <laughs> he'd no hope and we got married at the tender age of 19 but you know it was very difficult for me getting married at because in all the times I've been at meetings and conferences down south I have never and I'm not saying they're not there but I've never met anyone older than me brought up in a Christian home so I'm in my 40s. Um, and so that'll tell you how new this all is. Like I was literally, like people didn't get married until their 30s. I was like one of the few. Now there's plenty of young couples getting married and that. But it was just, everything was so new and so raw. And I think it's, it's, it's wonderful in, in some ways because you don't need to go to the Amazon jungle to find people who haven't heard the gospel. They literally have never heard it. And it's, it's wonderful to be in a place where you can be that voice. Um, years later then, we, we ended up um, w- with a church in Limerick. And obviously all, all that goes with that. We've seen people getting saved. It's been amazing. It's been hard. Uh, again, it's, people will not really come into a church unless they know someone. It, how I would describe it to any of you guys here is if I said, come on, let's go to the Mormon church, you'd be like, no, we're not going in there. That's the way they feel about coming into our church. That's literally the only way I can describe how alien it is. They don't know what you're going to do. They don't know if there's going to be machines coming down off the wall. They just genuinely don't. So unless they trust someone and know someone, that will be the way they come in. And this last um, year and a half has been really uh, a shaking time, a real shaking time. We have uh, the government... uh, closed churches for 10 months so you guys didn't have half as much closer closures up here uh, for 10 months you know that scripture where it says do not forsake the gathering of yourselves and we all know that one and we've seen maybe individuals who have maybe taken a job on a Sunday and and you just know just give it time we're all the same if we don't get that fellowship it'll wear you down and eventually out the other side we've seen the ones or twos but what we've seen is hundreds who haven't had fellowship for 10 months. And the effect is, it's really quite upsetting to see. Part of you knows it has to happen, but it's still very hard to see it. Most of the churches that have gone back are seeing less than half of the congregation return. Um, There's a lot of moving. There's a lot of people leaving. My own brother has left his church after 17 years. There's a lot of moving. And you're like, Lord, what are you doing? And I was reminded of a vision that uh, this faith mission uh, pilgrim guy called Johnny Hamilton, I don't know if any of you have heard of him. He was 15 years ago visiting a church in Limerick. And I remember in the back of my head putting this there. And it was a vision of the island of Ireland being shaken and shaken so much. But what was happening in the shaking was that he said, the Lord said to him, there are people in ministries and in churches, they're not supposed to be there. And when the shaking was finished, everyone was where they were supposed to be. And I've never seen such a time of movement and some of it necessary. 
you've got the apathy and the falling away, but you, you see people moving that have been in a situation for years. And I have to believe that the Lord is in that that he is moving people, preparing the scene of time. Because we, like, since I was saved, like, I, I've been listening that, of the need for revival and, and we need revival. And I remember at the very start of this pandemic, listening to a sermon and the preacher said, if we don't have the Holy Spirit coming out of this, we're not going to make it. And I have to say, it doesn't look good in the natural. In Southern Ireland, it doesn't look good. There's, it's devastated. There's people falling away left, right and centre. But I have to believe that the Lord is setting the stage because we need the Holy Spirit. Now, during the, lock, the first lockdown, my eldest son, uh, had one of his student friends, who's from Malaysia, and he's wor- working or studying in Ireland for two years, just started asking Jesse loads of questions about the Lord and the whole lot. And he ended up, ringing Jesse at three in the morning going, tell me, what, what do I do? I, 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 I have to. This is true. I know this is true. So Jesse um, prayed. They prayed together on the phone. Jesse came in and told me the next day and he was crying at the end of the bed. He was so moved because it's the first time really that that's happened. And at the time, we were kind of more or less underground. Churches were allowed to be open for prayer, but that would have been the rosary as far as they were concerned, which is somebody going in and going back out again. So we were meeting for prayer. So it was all very low key. There was no worship. There was nothing. That's all he knew. I used to see he's, he used to wear yellow, yellow Crocs. Weird, but I, <laughs> as they do students. But you could see the yellow Crocs at the bottom of. The, it's kind of my abiding memory of the lockdown because you'd be watching all the feet because you could see some guards coming along. You'd be like, ah! so yellow Crocs coming along, and he'd come in, and that's all he knew. He thought this was great. See, guys, we don't need everything we think we need. I mean, we thought we were simple and stripped back and whatever, but lads, we were pruned back. We were like a little twig by the end of it. But he's like, this is great. And I do want to just, and I'll bring that story around again. I would like to address the young people here, especially the young people that have been brought up in Christian homes. My heart breaks when I see young people sitting there with a look of intense boredom and get me out of here look on their faces, it breaks my heart. Because guys, I was brought up in a Christian home. You know what, I had about three or four times that I was so badly betrayed by churches and by Christians, I could have walked away. In fact, I nearly did. Once, I decided, that's it, good luck. I'm having nothing more to do with this. They're a pack of hypocrites. Some of you might be thinking that today. And we, we went to Spain on holidays and we went into a, a, it's a, an expat church because we obviously can't understand Spanish. And I was dragged in because I was like, girl, I don't want to go. I wanted to go to the beach. That's how bad I was. We went in and as we're going out, I was like, get me out as soon as it was finished. And this one came running after us. Come back, come back. There's an Irish couple here. And so this couple came around the corner, flame and red hair, was as Irish now as you could get. And they were like, are you from Ireland? And are you Christians? Turns out that they were settled travellers. They'd won the lottery in Ireland. She said, if we don't move from Ireland, he's going to drink himself to death. They moved to Spain and their next door neighbours were Christians. They became Christians, but they'd never met Irish Christians. They're literally sitting in front of us crying, going, oh telling their story full of the joy of the Lord. And you know what the Lord said to me? This is the gospel. This is the truth. This is what you're turning your back on. Now, they had no idea they were being used that way. Fast forward 10 years. We were in a situation in the church that nearly broke us. We were feeling really, really low. We thought, this is it. We're not going to make it anymore. The door opens. Who comes in? That couple. It's like the Lord saying, I'm I'm still the same. I'm still the same. And you young people, for my job, I go into secondary schools and I talk about social media and all that goes on. I'm under no illusions what it's like to be a young person in this generation. And I have a question for you. Is that what you want? Do you want all of that? Because this world will eat you alive. I have myriads of young people coming up to me crying, showing me scars telling me the things, they are devastated. 
the devil will try and tell you that it's out there and that the peace and joy is out there. But guys, and you see the way you're sitting there bored out of your tree? That's not Christianity. That is not Christianity. If you're here and you feel nothing, and you know, I would just, my heart would love to see even just one of you here tonight just break that hardness, that I've heard it all before, that cynicism. And, and listen, I have plenty of reason to walk away. Haven't had it easy. But I would not trade this life for anything. I have a peace. Does everything go right in my life? My father died of a heart attack at 57. I could go on. The amount of tragedy and trauma. But I have Christ in it every inch of the way. And there was just... Um, I read a verse then just to say, how are we going to go forward? And we heard from Gareth this morning. Um, David, of course, had a real, the psalmist had a real love for the justice of God. That really marked him out. He, he knew that God was just. And he says, I will thank the Lord because he is just. It's not a word that we use kind of generally. So I said, I said I'll have a look and see what does just actually mean. And it means behaving according to what is morally right and fair. Fair to all sides. If we ever needed that, it's now. What does it actually mean to be righteous, real, genuine? And it means to be guided, and this is so important for the times we're living in, guided by truth, reason, justice, and fairness. Wouldn't you love to see that? Do you know what, young people, teenagers, they can't stand hypocrisy. They're like, oh, don't tell me one thing now and do another. And I kind of like that about them. I'm a bit like that myself. I can't stand it. But why not be a generation guided by truth, reason? You don't lose your reason because you become a Christian. You, you still lose your head. Justice and fairness. That's the kind of young people we need for our island. And you, you, there's so many decisions you've got to make now going forward. Some serious decisions of who you're going to spend the rest of your life with. This young man that got saved during the lockdown went back to Malaysia after his visa expired. While he's in the airport in Kuala Lumpur, he meets a girl, gets chatting to her. Turns out she's a Christian, going back from London, back to the same city. She asked the Lord, I'd like some Christian friends because she was starting new. She'd been away so long. She saw on his screensaver a picture of a cross and a verse. They are now arrived back into the church three weeks ago he comes in the door and goes <gasps> his eyes fill up with tears he goes this is where it all happened and I'm looking around at the bedraggled state of us and he goes this is where it all happens and he's holding the hand of this beautiful Christian girl it's like something out of a Christian hallmark <laughs> but the Lord orders that young man's steps now every big decision that he has to make our eldest son just got engaged to a lovely Christian girl these are the blessings of following God. Otherwise, you're going to have chaos. You're going to have turmoil. You're going to have to try and make all the decisions on your own. Because you can't pray. You don't want to pray about it. You're left to your own devices trying to make your own decisions. You're, and I tell you, this world will eat you up. But instead, Jesus. And guys, listen. I have to say, and I promise Tim hasn't paid me to say this. There's a famine of good churches. We have people ring, ring us only a couple of days ago looking to come and see what the church is like. There's a famine. People are wandering. They're starving. And what we had here this morning was a feast. There was the presence of God. There's mercy. There's faith. There's grace. You young people here, there's people in Limerick would give anything for what you have here. And you're not eating. You're, you're, you're like beggars. There's this massive table here. There's provision. And you're just scrabbling around with little crumbs. Emaciated. That's, that's what you are. Before God. He sees. You're stripped in front of him. But God can and will clothe you. With the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I 
I'm telling you that this life is amazing. The one thing I always say, you'll never be bored. You'll be a lot of things, but you'll never be bored because the Lord brings you on a journey. You meet people, you talk to people, and you find out the Lord is working. One final little story. Because of the lockdown, I haven't been able to meet too many of the mums in the school that our kids go to, and there was a little party, and we we were talking about something anyway, and I said, I'm not great at Irish. (laughs) And one of the mums said, you, walking back to the car, said, you might be careful about not saying that you're good at Irish because they might, they're kind of big into the Irish here. And I said to her, you know what? I said, I'm so used to being different. I said, imagine if they knew that I'm not Catholic. <laughs> and her face. And I said, imagine if they knew that my husband is a pastor. You can't even say pastor, you say minister. They don't even understand what pastor means. And I said, and then, and then to make matters worse, <laughs> I homeschooled my kids for eight years. And she's like, what? Two hours later, she's pouring out her heart. She tells me that she feels like she hasn't fitted in her whole life. And she's been searching. She rings, texts me, can I meet her the next morning? She said that night she could. She was so excited about everything. She said at three o'clock in the morning, she said it was as... I said, I don't know how to describe this. She said, it was like Jesus came into the room. She said, I felt like my heart was going to explode. Now, I, what did I do? She was ready. She's like the Ethiopian. Who's going to tell me? The world, the harvest is there. They are desperate for the truth. They're searching for the truth. All we are is ambassadors. And the one thing I will say as well is, not to be afraid to be different. That's what they like. She was like, oh, I must talk to you because I'm not the same as everyone else. As the song says, I am not the same. We are different. We are always going to be different. And this idea of trying to make the church so like the world that they like us, that's not what they want. They want reality. They want truth. They want freedom. They want forgiveness. And as long as we have that in our churches, then we'll see the fruit. When they come in and they find Jesus, that young man, when he came in, he found nothing. (laughs) There was no music. There was nothing. There was a handful of people. We were like the upper room. We were quivering inside. But he found Jesus. And he, he is enough. And I just plead with you, just call on the Lord while he is near. You have no idea. One thing I, I talk to Christians who are who find the Lord later on in life and the one thing they'll say is, I wish I knew this sooner. I used to say to Garrett, oh, my testimony isn't great. And he was like, don't ever say that. I came into the relationship, even the marriage relationship, I had no bags hanging off me. It's a blessing that not everybody gets, but the privilege of being brought up in a Christian home and being sheltered from so much that will just devour you and eat you alive. But that's not enough. We have got to know that experience ourselves we'll end up like america where people just go to church and they're not christians they're generations later it's just religion if if the next generation doesn't know christ the same way we done we're going to have churches full of people who are not christians god forbid because this life is to be lived to the full and i thank the lord absolutely praise the lord for saving me i i Save the Lord for or thank the Lord too for keeping me. So many times I wanted to walk away. So many times, but it's too he's too real. He's always there. And finally there's one young man and uh, he'd walking away from the Lord and he said, I, I want to come back. And somebody asked him, What do you want to go back there for? And he says, Because I miss it. And he said, Yeah, but what do you miss? And he said, I miss Jesus. I thought, well now that that's a heart after God. I don't miss the worship, I don't miss the people. I'm sure he probably does a bit, but it's Jesus who he really misses. And I uh, just want to thank the Lord for for all that he's done in our life. And and if any of the, the young people, I, I, I don't want you to drag this on for years. I don't want you to think, oh, you know what, I'll do this in a few years' time when I settle down. The decisions you make now at this crossroads of your life, and the thing is, the Lord recently revealed to me, I, I said to Garrett, oh, I think we're at a crossroads. And the Lord actually said, you know that verse where it says, 
when you turn to the left or to the right, the voice behind you will say, this is the way you walk in. And I suddenly realized, no, 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 we're not at a crossroads, you're at a junction. There is no ambling forward. There's a left or there's a right. There's a decision to be made. And one of those will be the wrong one. Crossroads are great because you can just keep going. Hope for the best. I have an awful habit of doing that myself when I have a big decision. Oh, I'm at a crossroads. It's only when you make that turn you're going to hear that voice. And I said to myself, why is it behind? Because it's, it's about faith. You can't see. It's behind. It's not even, you can't trust yourself sometimes when you're making these decisions. But it's behind. He's there. He's, he's going to tell you this is the way. And there is a decision. It's left or right, guys. It's a junction. And whatever that decision is, you're making a decision every day and bearing the consequences of that. So I plead with you guys, and if anybody wants to talk to me or whatever, I, I just, I'm here and I'm sure the church is here. I just want to thank the Lord for all that he has done and encourage you just to find the Lord because I'm telling you this life is, yes, there is sacrifice. Yes, it is hard. Yes, you will be ostracized. Yes, you'll be different. Yes, you'll be misunderstood, but it'll be worth it all when we see Jesus. Amen.